morning, Cedarville family. I want to invite you to turn in your Bible with me to the book of the Revelation, the fifth chapter. While you're turning there, uh, I want to say it is a great honor to be here. And I'm going to put before you at the very beginning a question that I will raise again and again in my time with you. And that question is an interesting one, has to do with missions. Now, often people will say that all of us should ask the Lord, uh, Lord, should I go? And that is a good question. I, I would not in any way uh, denigrate that question. But I have a different question I want you to consider during our time together. And that question is this, Lord, why should I stay? Lord, why should I stay? stay. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful school and these young men and women that are here preparing for various callings in life, all of which, Lord, you will use for your great glory if they will let them. And Father, I do believe that in these days you're going to call out from this place many, that uh, you're going to change what they thought was their future course into something entirely different because they are going to put before you that question, Lord, why should I stay? And you're going to tell them you shouldn't. You should go. And so, Lord, we just simply ask for you to speak to us this day through your word. And may we be open and receptive to whatever it is you say to us. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. The Lion, the Lamb, and the World, Revelation chapter 5. When I was in graduate school at the University of Texas at Arlington, I encountered there uh, a kaleidoscope of worldviews. At a state university, you would expect that to be the case, and it was certainly true. Now, there were people in that graduate program, just like me, Bible-believing evangelical Christians, committed uh, to the inerrancy of the Bible, committed to a supernatural worldview. Uh, But there were others in the program that actually would refer to themselves as liberal Christians. And by that they meant, you know, I'm not sure about supernaturalism. I'm not sure uh, that Jesus was virgin born. I'm not sure uh, that Jesus walked on water. I'm not even sure that Jesus was raised from the dead. But I do like the moral teachings of the Bible. The the world would be a better place uh, if we would follow the Sermon on the Mount. And then there were people in that program from different uh, religions altogether. I had classmates that were Buddhist and Hindu and Muslim and a number that were Jewish. And I also had some classmates and most of my professors who were either agnostic or atheistic. Now, I remember one evening in a class on rhetoric taught by a very uh, avowed, very convictional atheist I remember a young lady in the class raising her hand. I don't remember the context, but I will never forget the question. Because she looked at him and she said, can I ask you this question? Uh, What do you believe the future holds for mankind? And he did not answer immediately, but after reflecting upon that question for a few moments, he said, well, I'm not very optimistic. When I study history, I discover that man does not treat man very well. When I look at the contemporary situation, it seems to me that not much has changed. And then he made a statement that I have remembered all these many years now. He said this, I believe the future holds for mankind certain destruction and potential annihilation. I am not very hopeful about the future. Now, let me be honest with you this morning. If I were an atheist, an agnostic, If I did not believe that there was a sovereign, supernatural, omnipotent God in control of all things, I would agree with him exactly. I do believe if man must save himself, then the future holds certain destruction and potential annihilation. But you see, that's where Revelation chapter 5 comes in and is so very, very important. Because if I were to summarize this morning for you, What Revelation 5 is saying, I could do it by a little song uh, that I was taught as a little boy in a Baptist church in Atlanta, Georgia. And that song simply says this, speaking of our God, he has got the whole world in his hands. This world is not out of control. 
This world is not moving forward willy-nilly with no one at the helm. Why? Because the Bible teaches us that right now in heaven, there is a lamb sitting on a throne, and he is guiding, and he is directing, and he is orchestrating all things to their perfect climactic end, which will include people gathered around his throne forever and ever and ever from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. And that is what Revelation chapter 5 is all about as it talks to us about the Lamb, the Lion, and the world. There are three movements to this text that I want to walk you through quickly this morning. First of all, in the first five verses, the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is indeed the Lamb upon the throne. Why? Because he is the Lord of history. Look at chapter 5 and verse 1. John says, Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. Now, of course, the throne is the place of authority. The word throne occurs almost 50 times in the book of Revelation. In the Semitic mind, the right hand is the hand of authority. So in the place of authority... And in the hand of authority, John says, I saw someone seated. Now, you really can't understand Revelation 5 without understanding Revelation 4. Because the two really are combined. They're, they're one vision of two parts. In chapter 4, the focus is on God the Father and creation. In chapter 5, the focus is on God the Son and salvation. And so basically the argument of Revelation is this. Both by creation and redemption, God has the right to do with this world as he pleases. So God the Father is sitting on the throne, and he has in his right hand a scroll filled with information. Because the Bible says it was filled, uh, written within and on the back. So it's filled with information. And secondly, he says it is sealed perfectly because it is sealed with seven seals. Now, many theologians and many Bible teachers, of course, raise the question, what is this scroll in the right hand of God the Father? And there are many, many different answers that are given, but just to cut to the chase, I think the scroll is the remainder of the book of Revelation because in chapter 6, the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, having taken the scroll from God the Father, begins to break its seven seals. And so what then unfolds is Revelation 6 through Revelation 22. And if we were to quickly summarize what is the content of the remainder of the book of Revelation, you could do it in three words. Judgment, salvation, and restoration. Judgment, salvation, and restoration. Judgment. You have the seal judgments of chapter 6. You have the trumpet judgments of chapters 8 and 9. You have the bowl judgments of chapter 16. God indeed, as we move toward the end of history, is going to pour out his judgment on a world that has rejected his lordship. But not is it only a book of judgment, it is also a book of salvation. Just take, for example, chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, the first eight verses, we discover a wonderful truth. God is not through with the Jew. Indeed, he is going to seal 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel as we move toward the end of time. I believe personally, these will be great Jewish evangelists that will go across the world sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ as missionaries. It's in perfect harmony, by the way. With what Paul said in Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 and 26 where he says, looking to the future, there's coming a day when all of Israel will be saved. It's in perfect harmony with the Old Testament prophet Zechariah who said in chapter 12 and verse 10, again, looking to the end of the age, speaking of the Jewish people, they will look upon him whom they pierced. And they will weep as for an only son. So God is not through with the Jew. He is going to bring many of them to, to himself as we move toward the end of history. But look at Revelation chapter 7 for just a moment. And look at verse 9 and verse 10. Verse 9. After this, John says, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. Where are they from, John? From every nation 
from all tribes and peoples and languages. They are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they're clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they're crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now listen to me. That is what I call the great missionary promise in the Bible. And that promise is this. God has promised us. God has declared it will be so. That in heaven for all of eternity, there will be people from every tribe, every language, every nation, worshiping around the throne and adoring the Lord Jesus Christ. It is going to happen. Now the issue is this. Will you be involved in God's great missionary plan? Or will you play the fool and sit on the sideline and watch? Our churches are filled with sideliners. Filled with people who are watching what God is doing and they don't pray, they don't give. The idea of going would never even cross their mind and they will miss out. They will get to the end of their life. And as John Piper says, they will throw up their hands in regret. I live a wasted life. Why would we not join hands with God? Because he has made us a promise. When you go, you will reap and you will see the nations come. That is in this book along with the last two chapters of restoration where we have the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem where the Bible tells us there's coming a day when there'll be no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more death because our God is going to make all things new. All of that is in this scroll in the right hand of God the Father. But look at what happens in verse 2. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, and here's the key question, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And here's the answer, no one. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to even look into it. And so for a fleeting moment, it looks like God's great missionary plan is not going to come to fruition. But then verse 4, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. But one of the elders, one of the redeemed from chapter 4, one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Number one, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, a messianic title from Genesis chapter 49, informing us that the Messiah would be a, a great king. Secondly, he is the root of David. You find that title both in Isaiah chapter 11 and Jeremiah chapter 23 telling us that all of the messianic blessings are going to come through the seed of David. So he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David. And what? He's conquered. He has prevailed. He has overcome And he can open the scroll and he can break its seven seals. That is why Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. But number two, Jesus Christ is also the Lord of victory. When you come to verse six and verse seven, you're not really prepared for what you read. We have been told to look for a lion-like figure. I always think of Aslan in in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, a lion-like figure, the root of David. But that's not what we see at all. Look at how John very dramatically unfolds the picture there in verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures, angelic beings of worship, and among the elders, the redeemed, I saw, not a lion, I saw not the root of David. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now, I could spend the rest of this morning, this afternoon, and really this whole week unfolding for you a rich theology of the lamb that runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation. But let me just give you the the synopsis this morning. The word lamb here is the word arneos in the Greek language. It occurs 29 times 
in the book of Revelation. Only one time does this particular word occur outside of Revelation, and that's in John chapter 21 when Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my lambs. So that's the only time it occurs outside of Revelation. 29 times it occurs in Revelation. Now listen to me, 28 times it's a reference to Jesus, which means there's one time in Revelation where the word lamb is used, but it is not a reference to our Lord. And it's very instructive, very, very instructive. So for just a moment, one last time, turning your Bible over to chapter 13 and look with me at verse 11. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. Now, this is a missions conference. It's not a prophecy conference, okay? But uh, very quickly, you need to understand the context of what's going on here. In Revelation chapter 12 and 13, by the way, I don't care if you're premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, partial rapture, pre-wrath rapture, I don't care. Now, actually, I do. You need to be pre-trib and premillennial, which is the correct biblical view. But anyway, <laughs> having just put that out there, it doesn't matter where you fall on the eschatological system. Here's what's going on in chapter 12 and 13. We're introduced to nothing less than a counterfeit trinity. In chapter 12 and leading into chapter 13, there is the dragon, who of course is Satan, who counterfeits God the Father. Then in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, we are introduced to a beast who comes out of the sea. Interestingly, the word antichrist never occurs in the book of Revelation. Now, it is used by John in 1 John 2, 1 John 4, 2 John 7. Paul calls the same person the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians. But here in Revelation, he is called the beast, and he actually experiences what appears to be a death and a miraculous resurrection. And yes, of course, the Antichrist counterfeits the ministry of God the Son. But then in chapter 13, verse 11 through verse 18, we are introduced to a third figure. He is later identified as the false prophet. And what does he do? He counterfeits the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And look at what the Bible says about this beast in verse 11 of chapter 13. Then I saw another beast rising up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb... And it spoke like a dragon. It looks like a friend. It looks like it's on God's side. After all, it looks like a lamb. But of course, we all know the saying, looks can be deceiving. And John would say, don't look at his appearance. Listen to his words. Because his words do not line up with God. His words line up with Satan. Now, let me just be very transparent this morning before I move on. I, I'm an ordained Baptist minister. I just turned 63 years old. I've been in the ministry for 43 years. I'm ordained. I am licensed. Uh, I have a PhD. I have been preaching and teaching now for over 40 years. I'm standing behind a pulpit this morning. I'm standing behind a Bible today. But if what I say this morning does not match up with this book, you ought to reject everything I say as being of the devil and coming from a false prophet. On the other hand, if what I say does match up with this book, you are obligated not only to believe it, but to obey it. Not because I said it, but because I was faithful to proclaim the infallible and the inerrant word of God. And again, we live in a day of much deception. We live in a day of many false teachers. And amazingly, some of them stand behind pulpits. Some of them stand behind Bibles. Some of them have massive television ministries and podcasts and every other social media. But it doesn't matter how they look. What matters is what comes out of their mouth. And the Bible says there are those who look like a friend, but they are actually the enemy. Now, go back to chapter 5 and look at the portrait of the real lamb. Verse 6 again. Between the throne, 
the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. As though it had been slain speaks of his crucifixion. Standing, of course, speaks of his glorious resurrection. And then comes some of the most mysterious words in all the Bible. This lamb who bears the marks of sacrifice but is now standing, has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. What in the world is that all about? I remember a number of years ago, I was invited to do a prophecy conference at a church. And I taught that morning on Revelation chapter 5. And when we got in our uh, van to go home, as Thomas mentioned a moment ago, Dr. White, I have four sons. and At that time, they were young. And so as we were driving home, they said, Daddy, can we talk to you about your sermon? And I was like, well, great. Of course, any daddy would be happy that his small children had listened to his sermon. And so I said, well, sure, what what do you want to talk about? And one of the boys said, your sermon scared us, and we didn't like it. (laughs) And I said, well, okay, what scared you? And they said, you said Jesus has seven horns sticking out of his head and seven eyes across his face, and that scares us. And so I looked at their mother, and she said, you pick the sermon, you take care of it. So I got, I got no help at all from my wife, none. So I began to think very quickly, and at that time, we were living in Dallas, Texas, and so I said, well, guys, let, let me ask you a question. Who is our favorite football team? And they quickly said, The Dallas Cowboys. And for us, yes, we lived in Dallas for 15 years. We became Cowboy fans. That's all right, great. Are they really Cowboys? And they said, well, no, Daddy, they're not Cowboys. They're football players. I said, that's right. Then why do we call them Cowboys? And they thought for a moment, and they said, well, because Cowboys are supposed to be rough and tough. And I said, that's exactly right. And what we hoped, not been true for a long time, but what we hoped... (laughs) is that our Dallas Cowboys will be rough and tough. It's kind of a picture of what we hope they will be. I said, well, guys, that what is, that's what's happening in Revelation. Now, I didn't use this word, but I said, it's apocalyptic literature. It's symbolic. It's painting a picture for us. And I said, horns in the Bible are a symbol of power. Seven is the number of perfection. So you put together, it's simply saying he has perfect power. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. Eyes see. Eyes are the primary means whereby you and I gain knowledge. So eyes, knowledge, seven, perfect. He's got perfect knowledge. He knows everything. He is the omniscient one. And then the most difficult one of all is that last phrase, and these are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Well, we know they're not seven spirits of God. There's only one spirit of God, but the number seven speaks of his perfection of his fullness. And where does he go? He goes out into all of the earth, speaking of his omnipresence. In other words, brothers and sisters, if all I had was Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 7, I would know that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is absolute undiminished deity. Only God is all-powerful. Only God is all-knowing. Only God is everywhere present. And because of who he is and what he has done, look at what it says there in verse 7, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. One man, in reflecting upon these verses, simply sat down and penned this little poem. Mary had a little lamb. His soul was white as snow. And everywhere the father sent, the lamb was sure to go. He came to earth to die one day, the sin of man to atone. But now he reigns in heaven above. He's the lamb upon the throne. Jesus Christ, Lord of history. Jesus Christ, Lord of victory. Number three, Jesus Christ, Lord of glory. In verses 8 through 14, we have three beautiful hymns that are sung to the praise of the Lamb in heaven. The first hymn is sung by the saints. The second hymn is sung by the angels. The third hymn is sung by all of creation. I walk you through them very quickly. Verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, 
the four living creatures, these angelic beings of worship, and the 24 elders, the redeemed, they fell down before the Lamb. First of all, they were holding a harp, the instrument of praise. And secondly, also golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So they come before the Lamb in praise and in prayer. And here's the song they sing in heaven. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? Don't miss this. For you were slain, and by your blood you have ransomed people for God. From where? Here's Revelation 7, the preview from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God. Kings we reign, priests we serve, and they shall reign on the earth. Well, the angels are watching this worship service and they are not going to sit on the sideline. Verse 11, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures, the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands. Now, don't get all hung up, please, on how many angels there are. But do pay careful attention to what angels do, verse 12. And they were saying, they were singing with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to what? To receive a sevenfold blessing, to receive power and wealth, wisdom and might. Stop. You can't give God any of those things. You can't give the lamb any of those things. He has all power. He has all wealth. He has all wisdom. He has all might. But we can give him the last three things. We can give him honor. We can give him glory. And we can bless his name. I love that last word there, blessing. It's a word that you would know even in Greek. It's the Greek word eulogia. We get our word eulogy from it. You say, well, a eulogy is something you normally do at a funeral. Isn't that right? Well, yes. Because the word simply means a good word. E-U, good, logia, word, a good word. Blessing fits it very well. And what the Bible is simply saying is this. As long as you and I have life and breath, we have the privilege and the opportunity to say a good word about the Lamb among the nations. Well, then it comes to a beautiful climactic end, verse 13. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, that's God the Father, and to the Lamb, that's God the Son, be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders, they fell down and worshiped. And some translations conclude with the phrase, and they worshiped him who lives forever and ever. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to be dismissed. But imagine with me for just a moment that before we leave this beautiful auditorium, suddenly the doors back there open and walking down here and standing in front of us was say the governor of Ohio or maybe a senator from this state or maybe from wherever you're from, a very important political figure like a governor or a senator. They're standing right here. You know, it would be right for us to acknowledge their presence and in some way appropriately recognize them. That would be the right thing for us to do. And you know, if in just a few moments before we leave, the door over there was to open and coming down here and standing in front of us right now was the president of the United States, Donald Trump. Whether you agree with his politics or not, doesn't matter. He's the president of the United States. And if he were standing here right now, I think it would be appropriate for us to honor and recognize his presence. We'd probably stand. I would. We'd probably applaud. I would. It would be the right thing to do. But you know, before we leave in just a second, suddenly standing right here in front of us was the Lord Jesus Christ. To applaud would be so inadequate. And to stand and applaud would almost be arrogant. It really would. You see, the only rightful response in light of who he is and what he has done is what it says there in verse 14. They fell down. They put their face on the ground. 
And they honored and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. He is worthy. So will you pray the prayer? Not Lord, should I go? Lord, in light of who you are and what you've done, Lord, why should I stay? Let's pray. Father, we bless you this day for your wonderful word that gives us a glorious picture of the Lamb of God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, though he still bears, I believe, the marks of his sacrifice, he is gloriously standing and he is seated at your right hand as the Lamb upon the throne in heaven. And by his shed blood, he has indeed bought people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. They are going to be there. You have promised it. And Lord, some of us, you are calling even now. You're stirring in our hearts. We should be those who go. Now, Lord, all of us should pray for the lost. All of us should give to reach the lost. Lord, all of us should be on mission to bring in the lost. But Lord, some of us, you have called to leave the comforts of home and to go to faraway difficult places because there are people there who have yet even one time to hear the name of Jesus. Lord, if that's what you have for our lives, then do it. For our good and for your great glory, we ask and pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.